Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining me on this Promise LA page on this Sunday afternoon. Um, I hope you guys are having a great uh, Sunday afternoon and, and you know, with uh, enjoying your weekend, uh, being with people around you that you love and care about. It's been a, it's a, been a great time uh, over these uh, last few days. And uh, be on the lookout. I am going to do a special uh, broadcast here soon, uh, giving you some updates of what's going on with Promise LA. Um, what does it look like? Timetables going back into the city. Uh, it's an exciting time. It really is. And uh, we got a lot of activities happening. And so, but, uh, you know, even with all that, there's nothing more important than getting into God's word and what God has to say to us. Amen. And so I want to express once again, my my appreciation and gratitude for all of you who listen in uh, each and every Sunday afternoon. Those of you who may be coming in even later and maybe you're not listening to it live, that's okay. You know, as long as you're getting the word in. And so uh, if you've been with me over these last few weeks, you know that we've been uh, in the book of Nehemiah. Exciting book uh, that talks about a young man who's called by God out of a place of exile uh, a Jewish man, young Jewish man, who was uh, a servant of the king of Persia at the time, got called by God to, to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, and, and what happens there is, uh, you know, it is really sets the tone for this whole series. And it's a series that we entitle Arise and Build. Because let's face it, as a, as a church with Promise LA and what we've been trying to do, in recent years, even before COVID and now afterwards, um, th it is time to arise and build. And, and you know, we, we have a, a premise of mind. What does that look like? And what, is, what should that be like as we, as we move forward uh, as a people and as a church? And really, we could take some of these elements out of uh, the book of Nehemiah. Because remember, you know, this, this book is, has been used for for, for a lot of um, literary writings for vision, leadership, success, even out in the world, even outside of the Christian, uh, the, the Christian environment. It's, it's been used as a platform to, to show people how to succeed in business, in commerce, in, in civics, uh, you know, servants, uh, civil servants. And so there, it has a lot of authority. And so I thought to myself, this is a great place for us to start um, as far as Promise LA is concerned. Because again, this, this book takes place as, as Nehemiah is uh, in exile with a lot of the other Jews uh, because they have rebelled against God. They had sinned against God. They turned their back against God. And God finally got fed up and he says, okay, I'm going to take you away uh, to in, into exile. Some of us who have done some time in the penal system know what that's like we're taken away from our homes we're taken away from our jobs our families those that we love and a lot of us spend a lot of time there and and it, it's almost like a form of exile except that we're still in the same country amen and so here was nehemiah and uh he, he's hanging out and and he sees his brethren coming back into the into persia after they they return from jerusalem and he and he's telling them, hey, guys, how's it going over there? And they tell him the situation with the wall. You see, back in those days, the wall was very important. It protected the city. It gave them a, a rep the, the city a reputation of one of being renowned and, and of order and, and of civil structure. And without the walls, nobody gave it any notice. People took what they wanted. The people were left unprotected and uh, and taken away sometimes. And so... The wall and the gates were very important. And so um, Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem all the way from Persia. God grants him favor not only with being able to go, but with supplies, personnel, and, and, and the grace to, to finish the project. And, and, and a few chapters ago, we, we read that, that scripture in, in Nehemiah 6, I believe, where Nehemiah, after 52 days, had completed the wall. And it was a great time. It was a great time of celebration. They completed the wall. And, and uh, last week we talked about, okay, now that the wall is done, is that it? No, no, no. A, a work of God will always require continuity. 
it will always uh, have some some something to, to continue on and to, and to create a legacy it's supposed to have been long term you're not just completing a task and then you're done with it and so we looked at some of those things about what that looks like and and now remember Nehemiah it's 13 chapters long so I can't adequately give you a recap uh, of all all the uh, eight chapters that were gone on before us, but I do want to encourage you because there's some some rich meat in this in this um, series. I would encourage you for those of you who are who are looking for life purpose, for lo- those of you who are looking for life meaning, for those of you who are looking for a new start in life. First of all, let it be in Christ Jesus because He's the only new start that you could ever have. That's going to be uh, that's always going to be uh, uh, fulfilling, that's going to give you joy, and it's always going to be everlasting. Amen? And so, uh, but if you're looking, maybe you're starting a new business, an enterprise, uh, a work, go back and and, 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 uh, and review some of the messages here. I, I believe you are going to uh, be able to pick away some of the, some, some principles that you can gain for yourself. Uh, I know as many times, as, as I read the book of Nehemiah, as Nehemiah is one of my first, my, my favorite uh, uh, books in all the Bible, that, uh, that even I, as I've dissected the, these scriptures, uh, it, it's given me a lot to, to, to really chew on. And so today, last week, I'm sorry, we, we, we talked about what it meant, what it meant for um, the, the people, what it meant for the people to, to return to the word of God. Because remember, the, 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 the city was rebuilt. The, the gates were reestablished. They gave them some, uh, some, some laws by saying, don't just let anybody else in here, but those that belong here, let them in. Because they're going to go in and they're going to influence people away from God. And it's going to just mess up the work that we've just, that we've just started. And, and so last week, we, we talked about how the people, they didn't look for... For political reform they didn't look for social reform they didn't look for financial reform they didn't look for all that but they, what they looked for was to return to the Word of God when they saw all the goodness of that God has done when they saw God's restoration on the city they said bring us the book bring us the book of the law and they had Ezra who was the scribe that was leading the uh, the Reformation of, of Jerusalem said read us the book and so, and so we've looked about what does that mean when, 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 when we're looking for a nationalistic reform, when you're looking for people to, to seek out God and say, what does that look like for each and every one of us? And, and again, I would encourage you to go back. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that message. And uh, I would encourage you to, 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 to let the word of God just soak in you so you could see that what, what's happened to the nation of Israel at the time as they started off this new venture, if you would, that it could be for you as well. And so um, go back and, and look at that. Go back and, and, and listen to that message and what, what that means to you and how it can mean like to you as you start off this, this new part of your life in, in, in taking the stance to arise and build. Now today, while last week was great, we saw a people returning to the Word of God, focusing on the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, and honoring the Word of God. Today I want to talk to you about something a little bit different. Because we could talk about a nationalistic reform all we want. But sooner or later, there's going to become disputes. There's going to become difference of opinions. There's going to come a time when, when, when this is what the nation says, but someone will rise up and say, well, I don't know, and kind of oppose that. Because see, while nationalistic reform, nationalistic change is great, and it's awesome to see that a nation would, tur- would turn back once again to God, it can only be persevering. And it can only last when that same attitude is taken in the heart of I- each individual. Let me show you what I mean. If you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 9. The story continues. I mean, I know like last week I, I called that title Civics because it, it reminded me of how we studied 
our role in in uh, in a in a civil society as we're getting of age and everything else like that to to say what are our rights and responsibilities as citizens and and it fit it really did fit to the message last week as we talk about the the nation returning back to God and 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 what does that mean for each and every one of us um, and so it really kind of, it applies to today too because it, it talks about our rights and responsibilities amen as as a nationalistic reform starts to happen but today what happens when the individual comes back if i had my choice and and i would have changed things i would have called last week's message reform one and the today's message reform two because reform one talks about it happening on a national level reform two happens on an individual level and for true change to happen for god to do a work for, for a rise and build to actually be a rise and build and continue and to live out a legacy, there has to be an individual reform. There has to be a change in the, in the heart of every man, woman, and child. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, go back and explain what I mean. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 9 and beginning with verse 2. Beginning with verse 2. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to verse 1 just for context. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of, of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and iniquities to their fathers. The, the people, even though, even though that, that the, we left last week with, uh, with Nehemiah, Ezra, and all the leaders saying, hey guys, this is a reason to, to celebrate. The reading of the law is, is a reason to rejoice. The reading of the law is, 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 uh, is an awesome thing as we, as we engage in his promise, as we engage in his word. And they told them, it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yet we go to Nehemiah chapter 9, and the people are running around in sackcloth and in ashes, amen, with fasting. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background, they, they, they did that during those days as a sign of mourning or grieving or even sometimes as a, a call to, to repentance and forgiveness of, to, to God. Not truly understanding that the, that the word of God actually said, yeah, I know that that God is righteous, and I know that God is loving, and he's favored us, and, and that we've all messed up. But, but the, the word of God actually says that, that he has loved us with an everlasting love. The word of God actually says if you will come back to him, he will forgive you. Amen? And, and, and yet the people still ran around with, with a burden on their hearts, uh, uh, something on their, on their hearts that, that wasn't meant for them to carry. It was, it, was something, it was something on them, that the, the guilt, the condemnation, that, that God already said, I'm, I've taken that away from you. I've separated your sins as far as the east and from the west. I, I, I remember your sins no more. Yes, though you come to me uh, as red as scarlet, I have washed you white as snow. And so all these things that, that, that God has promised, the nation of Israel... It just went right over their heads. It was, it was unforeseeable that that can actually happen. That forgiveness and restoration was truly theirs after all the wrong that's being done. And so they went around separating themselves and confessing sins to one another. Now, I know that the Bible says there's nothing wrong with confessing your sins. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we should confess our sins to one another. But here's the thing. You're not supposed to stay there. You're supposed to live in, in, the, in the truth and the fact that God has, has forgiven you of all that. That he's released you from the penalty of sin and death. As a matter of fact, for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, those things were, were, were put upon on Jesus when he went to the cross. Every single one. Every single one. Our, our sins, our sins um, in the past, our sins in the present, and yes, our sins in the future were laid upon Jesus. 
Uh, but yet we, 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 we walk around sometimes as if we're, we're victims of our own sin. We walk around uh, saying that, no, this is all that I deserve. And, and, and you know what? It's okay to feel humble and, and, and possibly pious and saying, I could, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Bible teaches you something different. The Bible teaches you that he has made you good enough. He has, has washed you white as snow. He has accepted you into the beloved. And there is no reason for you to carry that no longer. And it feels right to us in, in our flesh. It feels right to us because, because uh, you know, we, we, we don't see ourselves as being able to forgive our own sins and we walk around. The, par the problem with that is that we never get to a place of victory. We never get to a place to, to a place of deliverance and a place where God could use us as vessels of his glory and honor and of his grace. We can never get there. We can never walk in the power in which he's forgiven us because we're walking in defeat. And so for true change and reform to happen, there are three things that help us. Now, I understand, okay, there's nothing that we can do to bring about change in our own lives, amen? That it comes from God. Only God can do it. God could do it in a, in, in, a, in a snap of a finger if he wanted to. It can happen just like that. But there's some things that helps us with our mindset, with our, with our, uh, with our perception of what this tr truly is supposed to look like. When God brings about reform in our hearts, when God brings about change so we can move on to victory, when J God brings, out, brings on um, a, 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 a true identity for us and therefore bring about reform, I want to share some things out of this passage of scripture in, in Nehemiah chapter 9 that will help us to have the right mindset of who we are in Christ and, and what God is doing and wants to do in our lives. Because it's not just about the forgiveness of sin, although that's, that's awesome. Amen. How many of us can say that's awesome, that God has delivered me, the weight of sin and death is off of me, I'm walking in freedom today. But yet, there's more to what God has for us. He wants to bring us to a place of reform, of change, of revival. Not in just in a nationalistic sense, but in a personal sense. For you and for me. We talked about that. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. For for what people look at is as it's these things are for the good of the people. God also looks at it for the good of the person. So Nehemiah chapter nine. There are three things that I just want to share with you real quick. Real quick, I want to share with you what God has to say. What, what can we, 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 we know, what can we see as, uh, as, that could change our perception? We're not meant to walk around in sackcloth and in ashes. We're not walk around in the guilt and condemnation of our sins. Whom God has set free, he is free indeed. Whom the Son has set free. He is free indeed. Amen. Before these next things I share with you, let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for all that you've done and all that you do. Father God, I pray once again for your word, for your promises, for your guidance, for your direction that just leads us back to Jesus. Oh Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in this very hour that you would speak to your people, that you would touch, that you would guide, you would bless, that once again you would hide me behind the shadow of the cross, God, that indeed you would increase and that I would decrease, that you would take me out of the way of what it is that you're trying to accomplish today. Let your word be, be fall as seed on the fertile ground of our hearts, and that that which you have intended your word to accomplish would be done in the name of Jesus. Bless the, the, the reading and the, and the expounding of your word, dear Father God, and let it bring glory to yourself as we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. How can you have the right perception to bring about an individual reform, change, and revival? First of all, what you can do is you can acknowledge, you can acknowledge God as a priority. Prioritize 
the acknowledgement of who God is. Check this out in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. It says here, Blessed be your glorious name, who is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. In a sense, what the people of Israel were saying is that God is sovereign, he is glorious, and he is powerful, and he's worthy of our praise. Amen? He, 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 they were acknowledging God, even in the midst of, of wearing sackcloth and ashes, in the midst of carrying on their condemnation and their own guilt, which they should not have been carrying, they acknowledge who God is. So the word acknowledge means to recognize the importance or quality of. To make him a priority. To acknowledge him means to put him in mind in everything that you do. To acknowledge him means that, that uh, in, in your life, in, 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 your, in your quality of life, in your patterns of relationships, in your decision making, you ought to acknowledge God in, in my life, in my relationships, in my decision making. I need to acknowledge God. I need to, to put him in the forefront of my mind and say, God is important in these areas of my life. It's someone who's acknowledging God, the up, being of utmost importance, utmost of reverence. It, it, should, it should affect how you treat your spouse. It should affect the integrity of your work. It should even affect you serving at the church, at your local church. And I want to tell this to you. If you're really acknowledging God, God calls you to serve. If you're walking in and out of a church and, you say, and, you're, and you're, you're, you're putting a check mark and said, okay, I went to church today, and then you go home, and, and you do whatever you're supposed to do at home, and I get it, home is important then I kind of I have to question, are you really acknowledging it? Because God calls us to a place of service. God calls us to a place of stewardship. And, and if you're truly acknowledging God, it should affect this, these areas in your life. Check this out. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. A lot of you know this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. In other words, when you acknowledge God, ask yourself this. Is, is, is who I am, what I'm doing, what I'm deciding, is it consistent with God's word? Is, is it pleasing to God? With what I'm doing, is it pleasing to God? Will the, will the, the, the relationships I am in, my, my closest relationships, are they God honoring? Are, are, are they edifying to me in my relationship with God? Does it bring me closer to the purpose that he has for me? That he has for me. You need to ask yourself all these things because in this life, um, in this life, it's so easy to, to lean upon our own understanding. It's so easy to say, well, God gives me a brain and, um, and he knows my heart. And so, so it's okay. But when you acknowledge God, it puts God as a priority and say, I don't think God wants me to do this. I don't think this is the decision God would have me to make. I'm not sure that this is the relationship that God has for me. It will help you in all those areas of life. Because when you acknowledge God, then the Bible says that he will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. It, it, it will, he will guide us through all the landmines of life. The, all the traps and snares, the things that seem to knock us off course, all those things that bring more pain that we, than we ought to have. When you acknowledge God, he helps you avoid those things. He helps you avoid those things. And he can lead us to a place of fulfillment and joy and purpose. When you acknowledge God, he will direct your path. The, is he faithful to, to bring you back if you get knocked off course? Absolutely. Can, can he uh, prevent you from going through all that? Absolutely. Do you believe that's true? Some of you may be listening to me now. It's like, oh, but Pastor Daniel, you don't know what I've done. 
Oh, Pastor Daniel, you don't know what my life has been like. Can I tell you something in love? Sometimes the reasons why we experience heartaches and heartbreaks, sometimes the reasons why we experience missteps and mistakes is because we chose not to acknowledge God. We, we, we chose to, to do what was right in our own mind. And quite honestly, the Bible says that is sin. That's what actually led the people of Israel into rebellion because they did what was, was right in their, own, in their own sight. By God's grace, he could bring us back to the right direction in which he would have us go, especially going back to Jesus. Amen? But see, this is what the exiles knew. This is what the people that, that had been in exile away from their home, they, they knew that, that, that uh, they, 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 did, they made their own decisions. They didn't acknowledge God. They didn't do anything that, that was pleasing to God. They did what was right in their own minds, and it led them to a place of exile. It led them to a place of being foreigners in somebody's own land. It led them to a place of being tormented and looked at as second-class citizens. But God has, you, has, uh, has so much more for you than that. Maybe you're listening to this message today, and you feel that way. You feel like you're exiled. You're outside the commonwealth. You're a second-class citizen. You feel that way. I want to tell you that just as God... Had, had better uh, plans and intentions for the people of Israel coming back from the exile. He has special plans for you too. He got to have something more than what you're experiencing. He has something better than what you're going through. And he wants you to come back and say, Okay, Lord, I'm coming back and I will acknowledge you as my God. You will be my priority. The first thing that you need to do is to acknowledge him as God. To acknowledge him and trusting him that he is good and that he does good and he has good plans for you regardless of what 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 things look like around you i want you to know that today i want you to know that god has something special planned for you the second thing that you need to do after you acknowledge god is to know and revisit his faithfulness what do i mean by that well, the next verses, from verses all the way from verse 7 to verse 35. From verses 7 to verse 35, the, Nehemiah, he, he, he recaptures the history of Israel up until this time. It starts with the calling of Abram, which we know as Abraham, the father of the, the nation of Israel. He called them out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, who were, who were a bunch of pagan worshipers, right? And he says, I want you to go to the... To the land of which you do not know. And I am going to bless you. And I'm going to bless those that bless you. And then it proceeds on to, to where they were uh, in oppression in, in, in Egypt. And Pharaoh holding them captive. And he would not let God's people go. And it, went, and it goes from there to the, from God delivering his people with signs and wonders. And man, I would love to kind of just sit there and go through that those verses with you because I believe there's just a message in that alone. There's a message there where, where God was uh, um, guiding the people in the wilderness. You know, he brought them out with a pillar of fire by night and, and clouds to, over them by the day. Uh, finally bringing them to the place of, of, um, uh, uh, the, place of Canaan, the, the promised land, to where they, were, they experienced victory after victory after victory. That God fulfilled his promise to the nation of Israel when he brought them back to the good land in which he had promised. And so they talked about that, but there's also another aspect of this, of this because just like any other recap, there's, there's many places in, in the Bible where somebody would recap the, the, the history of Israel. That where they talked about, that started with, the, with God's goodness and his favor and his deliverance. But it also led to to the sin of the people. It always led to the re people rebelling against God and seeking out idols, worshiping idols instead of the one true God. And, and, and then it went down to a place of repentance and, and, and they called out to God in their misery and, and God forgave them and he restored them. That seemed to be the, the, the pattern uh, uh, when, they, when, when we revisit the nation, the nation of Israel's history. It, was, it always started with God's goodness. And it always continued on with the, with the sin of the people. 
and then it and then it continued on to to the people repenting and 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 turning back towards God, and, it, and then it goes for, to God forgiving them and restoring them. In verse twenty-eight, it, it it actually goes over and over again that the Bible says, "But after they had rest, they again did evil before you." You know, some of the original manuscripts actually says again and again again and again again and again they did evil before you that sounds like a lot of us amen that sounds like a lot of us who who have turned to god and went back towards our sin and and god would bring us out and we'd go back and and i mean it's crazy how this cycle works in so many of us some of us probably wouldn't want to admit it but yet the bible says that when they in, in verse 28 the second part of verse 28 it says, but yet when they returned and cried out to you, God, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. According to his mercies, God came and delivered them. When they sinned, when they rebelled, and when, and when they worshipped other gods, they found themselves in a predicament they couldn't get themselves out of. They found themselves in a situation that, that, that started out because they turned their backs on God. But yet when it started to get rough and it started to, 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 to get too hard for them, they called out to God and God from heaven heard them and he delivered them and he brought them to a good place. You and I are in that same relationship. Because of Jesus Christ, when you turn to God, he listens, he accepts, and he restores. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. God is faithful. I want you to know that today. Maybe you're, you're listening to this and you're like, again, you're like, man, I've messed up so many times. I've come to God and God, there's no way he's going to accept me. I've come to God before and, and then I went back to my own sin. And, and there's no way he can forgive me now. I've messed up too many times. I've taken his grace for granted. I, I've turned to him in church and then I turned back to the world when I thought no one was looking. I want to tell you something today. God is faithful. He could bring you to that place where he restores you, where, 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 where he reforms you, and where he revives you. And you could be used in that place of honor, in that place of glory, that where, you, where your life would be leveraged as a showcase of God's love and grace to the people around you. Second Timothy 2.13, it says, if, Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, because he cannot deny himself. Even when we are faithless. You know, you know what that uh, talks about? It talks about, uh, it talks about a marriage covenant relationship. It doesn't say that he has faith in you, because otherwise he's, he, he would be wrong, <laughs> amen, and God's not wrong. But what he's talking about is the relationship that you, and, that you and I have with him when we come to Christ. It's a marriage covenant relationship. Even when we mess up, even when we go about looking at other things and making other things a priority other than God, God remains faithful even though we're faithless. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. That's who he is. He's faithful can't deny his character. One of his characters is being faithful to you and to me. He won't let us go as long as you continue coming back to him. He won't let you go. And here's what I want you to tell you I want to tell you today. Maybe you you felt like you've messed up. Maybe you've fallen. Maybe you 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 feel defeated and you feel like, you know what, I I've I've fallen too much. You know, I have failed. I want to tell you when you've fallen, that is not failure. That is growth. And let God continue to grow you. Let, by His grace, let Him pick you up. Put you back on your feet. And, let, and see what He could do in your life. See, that's what this whole song from verses 7 to, 7 to 35 is. It's about Israel. Not, not just only sinning. Not just always rebelling. But it's about God's faithfulness. About when they cried out to God, He can continued. He continued to restore them, to revive them, and bring them back to a place in a right relationship with him. Once 
you revisit, oh, I'm sorry, once you acknowledge him as God, and once you revisit his faithfulness, you recall to mind, here's why it's good for you to read the, 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 the history of, of Israel. Because you, can, you and I could probably see ourselves in that, amen? You and I could probably see ourselves how, how, how we've experienced the goodness of God, the favor of God, and the, the deliverance of God. You and I could probably talk about that, and you and I could probably talk about how we messed up. But yet when we came back to God, God accepted us, and he restored us. And when we could do that, when we could acknowledge him, when we could revisit his faithfulness, and maybe even look at how he's been faithful to us, and you should be able to know that he's been faithful to each and every one of us. Then the covenant is re you recommit to the covenant in which he is given. Oh, there's a covenant, like I said, there there's a there's a marriage covenant relationship between us and God. And that happens through Jesus Christ. Just as the law in, in the book of Exodus was read at Mount Sinai and the people said amen and amen we agree with you God we agree with you we will be your followers we will be your people just as they too needed to to uh, renew that covenant you and I need to do that sometimes as well as a matter of fact there's many times when I've been in church many times when I've been preaching when we did an altar call for people to accept God Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior We've also included those that needed to recommit their lives back to Jesus. Because some of us need to recommit a few times over before God fully gets our attention. Amen? And I want to tell you, when you do that, when you do that, God is faithful to accept you back. God is faithful to accept you back. In, in John, uh, in, in John chapter 6, verse 37, it says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will not by no means cast out. If you come to Jesus today, he will not tell you, get out of here. You've messed up too much. Oh, that's what some of our friends might do. Some of the people around us would do. But not Jesus. He says that those who come to me, I will by no means cast out or cast away. You know, um, this covenant, sometimes we look at this covenant and we look at it as a synonym for the word contract, right? And sometimes we look at this word contract and like, well, a contract is meant to be broken, just like a divorce, right? And see, I, that's, that's part of our society today, is that it's so easy. People go into marriages so easily because like, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, we can always get a divorce. Oh, well, if this... If this deal with this other person doesn't work out, then there's always a loophole in that contract. There's always something there that I can get out of if this relationship doesn't work. But you see, you are in a covenant with God. A covenant with God for, is, 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 is different than a contract in two ways. One, it's not breakable. You're committed. You're committed. Most of all, he's committed to you. You want to know how? Because Jesus Christ already went to the cross. He already came into this world over 2,000 years ago. He, over 2,000 years ago, he went to the cross. To die on the cross. The, for your sins and for mine. Where his blood was shed. Where he suffered, died, and was buried. To, and then put into a grave. A tomb. An empty tomb. Where three days he would rise again. You know, you can't uncommit that. You can't undo that. He's already fulfilled his part. And just like any other two parties, when you fulfilled your side of a covenant, you will do anything you can for the other party to rise to the occasion to meet their side. And what's our side of the covenant? When Jesus Christ made that covenant with us, when there was a covenant, when he when he became the uh, the uh, the 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 means by which that testament, the, the covenant was, was, uh, was sealed, right? In which that covenant was, was enacted. When he did that, what did we get in return? We had forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to the Father. We were accepted in the Beloved in that relationship. He's given us life eternal and life uh, um, everlasting. 
He's, he's given us a plan and a purpose. For that, he receives our worship, our praise. He gets the glory. He gets the honor. And most of all, he gets us. Is what he wanted from all the beginning of time. You can't uncommit that. He's already fulfilled his part of the, the deal. He's became the reason of the, co the covenant. He's the reason. And he's fulfilled his side. And so because of that, when you come to him, when you, when you, when you come to him and say, Lord, I've messed up, he's not going to say, oh, well, you didn't fulfill your side. He's already done his side. He's already made a way for you and I. And maybe today you haven't experienced that in your life yet. Or maybe you have, but you haven't attained all into which he has given you. Think about this. Jesus Christ fulfilled his part already. He went to the cross. He, he was dead for three days in a, in, a, in a tomb. And he stayed there for three days. I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to be in a, in a tomb where somebody else was dead. Amen? But yet Jesus Christ, in fulfillment of all the Father's will, he suffered, died, and was buried. So not only can we acknowledge him, not only can we redeem him as being deem him as as being faithful, but we can all, all also renew the covenant that he has left wide open for us. For he that comes to me, I will know why is cast out. Will you come to him today? Maybe today you've never experienced the forgiveness of sins. Maybe today you've never have experienced a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You've never come to him. You've never asked him to forgive you. You've never experienced the freedom that comes through knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today is that day where you come to Jesus Christ. If that is you today, I want to pray for you. Will you allow me to lead you in a, in a, in a very short prayer? I say this every week. There's nothing magical about these words. It's not, a, it's not a spell or anything like that that makes everything magical. But what is truly divine, which is a work of God, is what he's doing in your heart today. What he's doing in your heart today. So will you pray with me? All you have to do is repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you. I rebelled against your law. And I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and deliver me from all unrighteousness. As I confess you now, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior, because you went to the cross to pay for my penalty of sin, where you suffered, where you died, and where you were buried. You paid for my sins. And on the third day you rose again. And because you live. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. And be I can also live forever. I ask you to give me your Holy Spirit. That I may live the rest of this life for you. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If that is you today, and, and you have prayed that prayer with me, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Will you uh, write on the comments below, say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. I, I, um, I committed my life to Jesus today. I, I accept him as my Lord and Savior, or I recommitted my life to him. Will, will you put a comment below this video and say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. I recommitted my life to Jesus. If you will do that, um, I will send you some information, um, some, some material that, that you should read, and uh, a Bible to put into your hands to, for you to, to go through that. And I want to be a resource for you. Maybe, maybe uh, you have some questions of the decision that you've made. I want to be a resource for you to say, hey, this, let, me, let me guide you through that. 
And uh, let me show you what God has, has showed me over these years. And uh, I want to be a resource for you, for you to, to know God even more, to know him intimately. Or, or maybe um, if the comment section is not for you, and uh, maybe you could go ahead and, and send me a message through Facebook Messenger. Will you do that? Say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today. Uh, or if you're, if you're listening to this somewhere else and you don't have access to those things, uh, you can always send me a, an email at promiselosangeles at gmail.com. Promiselosangeles at gmail.com. If you will do those things, I want to let you know that I will be a resource for you. I'll be here to be in contact with you. And... Um, and I want to be the first to welcome into you into the uh, into the family of God, Amen. Um, for those of you uh, that are listening to this and and you need prayer, please feel free to let us know. Uh, we have Thursday night prayer meetings uh, on Zoom. You can visit us online, um, so that it's convenient for you. If you would do that, that would be great. Uh, we want to pray with you. If uh, you're on this page, please. Uh, uh, go to the Promise LA page, like it, and you will see some announcements of when we meet for prayer meetings that we might be able to pray for you. Okay? God bless you guys. Thank you once again. Please be on the lookout for the announcements of some updates that are coming up as we're working feverishly to, to, to get back into the city that uh, we may be able to herald the, world of, the word of God into this lost and dying world right in our own city, the city of Los Angeles. God bless you. Thank you once again for joining me, and I look forward to talking to you soon. God bless.